Okay, hi and welcome to the 10th lecture in the course uh, Programming and Data Structures at Linnaeus University. Uh, this is the final course when we are uh, lecture when we are presenting a new material. Actually, after this lecture, we are considering you as <coughs> Java programmers. Uh, by then, you have seen almost all the features of Java. I would say that there are two features missing that we haven't presented in this course, and it's threads, how to run your program in parallel. And also, there are a few new features in Java 8, uh, method pointers and things like this that we haven't presented. But apart from that, uh, you know most of the features that are available in Java. If you would take a look at a Java program made by some professional programmer, you wouldn't probably understand all parts of the code, but you would order understand all constructs that are used. So they are basically the same things as you are doing now, only in a much larger context and a much larger scale. Yeah. This will be a very short lecture. Uh, I only have 15 slides, so I will do it in half an hour or 40 minutes. And also I say it's rather straightforward, the topic for today. Uh, we will talk about how to measure time and memory in your program. Uh, you will see how you can start the clock and you can stop the clock and you can measure the time interval between the start and the stop. It's very simple. And the same goes with memory. You can at any point in your execution stop for a while and say measure what memory am I using for the time being and then print it out or do something with it also. We will also talk about priority queues. This is the final data structure in this course and I think it's a funny one. Um, because it's implemented in a very clever way. Uh, but uh, that will be the second part of this lecture. Uh, measuring time. Uh, the class Java Lang system uh, actually comes with two methods that we can use to measure the time. One is called current time in millisecond. It provides a long, which is the number of milliseconds since January 1, 1970, for some reason. Uh, so, you can use it like this. Uh, at one point in the program, you are asking what is the current time. It will give you a very large number. You do something and afterwards you call the same method one more time. Get a, a slightly larger number and you compute the difference between after and before. And you have the time in milliseconds that was required to execute this code. Any questions about this one? There is another method, <coughs> nanotime. It's supposed to be even more precise than milliseconds. So you can do exactly the same thing, but you're just calling system nanotime. And it starts, uh, it gives you time, and you do the same thing afterwards, and you compute the difference. And now you will have the time in nanoseconds here. Uh, this is the new one. <coughs> Nano time. Uh, current time has actually an interpretation, as I said. It is the time in milliseconds since January 1, 1970. So if you have this huge number, you can actually give the exact date, starting uh, counting backwards to this time. Uh, this one has no interpretation. The value you receive, you shouldn't interpret it in any way, but it's done. Uh, nano time is done to measure time difference. So it's the time between two calls is the one that we are interested in, in, in over here. And this one is supposed to be more accurate than this one. Both of them are okay. I, this one is new and I for many years used this one. It is not the accuracy <coughs> uh, that is the problem. You will see what the problem with time measurement is something completely different that I will point out later on. But anyway, this one has an interpretation. This one has no interpretation used to measure elapsed time. This one is, according to Java, the most precise one. However, both of them are relying on the clock, the system, operating system clock. So actually, it might be more precise on an Apple or than in the Windows and things like this. So. The accuracy is depending on the operating system you are using. But both of them are, uh, for our purpose, they are uh, sufficient. Measuring memory. We have one class in the Java library called the runtime class. It comes with a number of methods. 
where you can ask uh, uh, what is the total memory, that is the memory allocated for the Java virtual machine, not necessarily the memory that you are using. When you are running this, when you are starting the Java virtual machine, it allocates a certain memory. This is the memory provided by total memory. You can also ask it, what is the available of free memory? And of course, in order to find out the used memory, you must get the total memory minus the free memory here. Then you will find out what is the available, how much memory am I using now. And it, it gives you the result in bytes. Usually we are thinking in megabytes, so you have to divide it by one million like this. Any questions with how to measure time and measure memory? Yeah. For the memory, is the memory of the stack or of the heap? heap. Yep. Uh, once in a while you are running your program, you are getting an error, out of memory error or something like this. Then you, of course, you should take a look in your code to see what if you are wasting memory in any particular way, but you can increase the amount of available memory for the Java virtual machine. You are using the GVM arguments. It looks something like this. You are in Eclipse, you go to run, you go to run configuration and you find arguments and VM arguments. In that slot you are adding these two uh, statements, uh, arguments. Uh, that will increase the available memory to two, 2 gigabytes. We are saying here that the, allocate, the memory allocated in the, the total memory is 2 gigabytes, we are saying here. And here we are saying that we should allocate them already from the beginning. So we are actually... Uh, you can say that... Uh, by saying that this one is 2 gigabyte, you are saying that, that the Java virtual machine might use up to 2 gigabyte. By specifying this one, you are saying that, okay, we are already from the beginning, we are using 2 gigabyte of memory. So, uh, if you run into memory errors, go to this part of your Eclipse and add these lines here of code, and then you can change the memory available for the Java virtual machine. Those of you who are playing around with a math set competition might run into memory problems and you might need to increase. We will use in the competition 2 giga gigabytes of memory. Uh, <coughs> so that's what you have to can play around with. <coughs> and the third exercise in assignment 4 is a straightforward application of measuring time. And we want you to concatenate a large number of strings. Do you remember what we meant by concatenation? Concatenating is adding strings together to build larger strings. You can do it in two ways. We can increase the string by adding a new string to it like this. We can repeatedly add strings together in this way. Or we can use a string builder and add the strings to it, and then ask the string builder to convert itself to a string. Which one is faster? String builder. String builder. How much faster? Uh, it, of course, it depends on what we are doing. Uh, but uh, how many concatenations can be done in one second? Concatenate short strings, only one character, or concatenate long strings, a row with 80 characters? We want you to actually see how many concatenations can be done in one second using this approach and this approach. It's rather straightforward. You will see that String Builder is much, much faster. So if you are in a situation where you should construct a large string by putting them together by smaller strings, you should always use a String Builder. It's much, much faster. Any problems with this exercise? There are more uh, instructions in the exercise descriptions. But basically the idea is just to see how many can be done in uh, one second. Uh, advices. <coughs> Do not trust time measurements of less than, say, 30 milliseconds. The thing is that although the clock is measuring milliseconds or even nanoseconds, things are going on in the background. 
that you cannot influence. For example, once in a while the computer stops and do a garbage collection. Uh, your program is not the only process running on your computer. There are some background processes that might interrupt your execution of the Java program. So in general, do not trust time measurements of less than 30 seconds. And if you want to measure something which uh, takes less than 30 seconds, you have to repeat the experiment many times and compute some kind of average value. So basically the idea to measure time is to start the clock, do something a number of times, stop the clock and compute the average time like this. You should, in a good measurement should be the clock time before and after should be preferably uh, a second or one tenth of a second. Something like this is often a good way of getting a good result. You shouldn't measure if the start of the clock and the stop of the clock is one millisecond, you are in trouble. So you will see that measuring time for very fast operation like binary search. Do you remember that I said that binary search, what is the time complexity of binary search? Log n. So in theory, if I'm having the size here and I measure the time to do a binary search, it should look something uh, like this. The problem is that in order to get the time here, which is say 30 milliseconds, the size here must be huge uh, and you will run out of memory. So certain things are should be straightforward to measure. You should increase the size here, you should measure the time here, but since this operation binary search is so fast, the sizes we need here in order to get decent values up here is beyond the heap size, the memory size. So measuring uh, very uh, fast operations like binary search and hashing is difficult. We need to repeat a lot. We need to measure not the time for one binary search but for a million binary searches, things like this, in order to get a decent memory measurement or time measurement. So always remember that your experiment is not the only activity running on the computer. You should always try to shut down other applications. You shouldn't play music in the background or something like this. It will actually affect your Java program, the performance of your Java program and change its behavior. Uh, still, even if you try to shut down all applications, the operating system will still be working in the background and you will see that you are measuring the same thing. The time to sort one million elements. You're measuring it one time, it takes one second, one second, one second, and then all of a sudden ten seconds. Uh, it is because that during one of your executions, the program stopped and the operating system stopped and did something, answering, receiving a mail or something like this. So if repeated runs give very different results, if you are running it again and again and again, your small program and it changes from one milliseconds to 100 milliseconds and 50, then something is wrong. The solution is often to increase the number of repetitions and compute an average over that one in that case. Or try to see what processes are running on your computer and try to uh, shut them down. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> the fifth, fourth and fifth exercise in assignment four, evaluate performance of your sorting algorithms from assignment two. Compare in search and sort with merge sort for both integers and strings. And the basic question is one, once again, how long arrays can be sorted in one second? Which one is faster, you think? Merge sort should be faster. If you have implemented it incorrectly, it should be much faster than in search and sort. It should be able to, to sort much larger arrays than in search and sort in one second. Uh, we also want to write a short report, basically how you did your experiment, what is your results and discussion. 
what are the sources? Uh, are you satisfied with your experiments? Do you think they are trustworthy in any way? Or do you have strange problems that the time should behave like this, but all of a sudden you have outliers in the measurements that might ruin your experiments? So, a short discussion. Any questions related to exercise 4 and 5? Basically, the setup you are using in exercise 3 to measure something for one second can be reused over here. So do it carefully in exercise 3 and you can basically just change the work task from concatenation to um, sorting and you reuse the same code. Questions about time measurements? Yeah. Yeah. When I run the main program, uh, every every uh, step is a bit faster. I don't know why. I mean, the first one is like six seconds. The second one will get to five point five. Yeah. The yeah. <coughs> the Java virtual machine actually need a bit of warm up time. It is slower in the beginning. What is the reason for that? Anyone with a good idea? Dynamic binding. No. Yeah. It is an. Uh, it is a, they are, they are running the program for uh, one second. Then actually it stops for a while and see if I can improve the code. So it stops for a while and rewrites the code in order to improve the performance. So in order to get a good measurement, you should actually, as you said, you should run the code uh, as a warm up session. And then you should start to do your measurements. After that, you will need, you want your, the your, your virtual machine to do all its optimizations before you start to do your time measurements. So you need to run it for a second uh, to do the optimizations, and then you should start to do your experiments. So you will often see that the first point, if you're increasing the size here, that this one, it should look like this, but the first one, looks like this. It's a bit slow, the first one. And it is because uh, the, uh, sometime, somewhere over here the Java virtual machine and actually optimizes the code to speed it up. Other questions? It's called the hotspot optimization. Okay. Let's move to what I think is more fun. <laughs> uh, a priority queue. Just the word uh, would say you that we are adding things to it, but we are picking them out in some kind of prioritized order. Uh, think of it as uh, tasks to be performed. Certain have a higher priority than others. And we are adding the tasks to a queue. We should do all these tasks. But we would lo would lo we, when we are asking the queue, give me the next uh, task, it should always give us the one with the highest priority. So it should in some way sort all the input and always return the one with the highest priority. So we are assuming that each element has a priority associated with it. Higher priority is served before an element with a lower priority. Same priority, they are served in insertion order or in any order. It's not that important. They have the same priority. Uh, most significant operations on a priority queue is insert, add element to the queue, pull highest, remove and return element with the highest priority. So from now on a priority is a positive number. Value 1 is the lowest priority, value very high is the one with the highest priority. Uh, how would you implement it? Uh, your first idea for internet. Well, I, I could think of a. We have the uh, a linked list where we are always keeping them sorted. So we have the one with the highest priority here: 32, 27, 6. Something like this. And when I'm adding a new one. Uh, I will just start here and I will see is it larger than this one? No, is it larger than this one? And I will find a suitable place for it and maybe insert 5 here before 4 is over here. So I can 
traverse the linked list, find a suitable place for the new task, the new element, insert it there, and we are done in, what is the time complexity for this operation? Linear, linear time. So we can do insertion in linear time. Uh, how would I do the pull highest? I uh, just return this one and say that head is pointing to this one. So we can do pull highest in 0 0.1 in constant time. Yeah, this would be a straightforward. However, a, a much more fun way of implementing it is to use something called binary heaps. Do you recognize them? Is this a binary search tree? No. It looks like it is a binary tree in the sense that every node has a maximum of two children. Uh, but they have a slightly different ordering of the nodes. Uh, it is always almost completely filled. We are adding new nodes layer by layer and from left to right. The next node that will be added should end up as the left child of six. So we are adding them one layer at a time. Uh, heap ordering. Uh, the parent is always larger than the children. The parent is always larger than its two children. But there is no such thing as the left child is larger than the right child. It, the only rule is that the parent should be larger than the children. And we should fill them one layer at a time. Uh, so in this case the top element will always be the largest element. Yeah. This is the basic idea. <coughs> Insert a new element. The algorithm is easy to understand. Okay, I have the tree here. This is my tree. And I would like to add 12. Then I start by adding it to the first vacant slot, empty slot. It will be down here. And then I compare it with its parent. If it's larger than the parent, I swap place with them. So I will swap 5 and 12. And then I continue. Is it larger than its parent? Yes. Swap 10 and 12. Is it larger than its parents? No. Then I stop. So after two parent swaps, it will end up over here. Okay. If I should add 14 to this tree. Where should I insert it first? As the hmm child of hmm. As the last child of... Yes, the first empty slot is the first child of six. So we are adding 14 here. Then we are comparing it with this one. Yes, it is larger, so 6 is moved down here and we have 14 up here. Yes, 7 is moved down here, 14 is up here. Yes, 14 up here and 13 is over here. Do you understand the idea for adding new elements uh, to the um, binary heap? Okay, remove. Similar idea, I should say that this process, adding it and moving it upwards, uh, is called percolation up. What is percolation? In Swedish it would be sippra. You are pouring water on ground and the water starts to go slowly through the ground. That's, it's percolating. Uh, uh, I don't know um, any other word in English for, for it. Uh, so it's called percolation up. Uh, Oops. Removing pull highest priority element. Yeah, we start by remove and return 11 here. Then we move, remove this node, take the value and insert it up here. So remove the value here, take the lowest, take the, first, the last value down here and move it up here. It looks like this then. And then the rule says. Uh, <coughs> swap place with the largest of your two children. You take this one, you identify that this is the largest child, then you swap with this one. 
Then you continue. Uh, do you have any child which is larger than the current one, which is one? Yes, this one, and you swap, and you swap, and you do it in two steps over here. Did you understand this one? <coughs> okay. If I, I um, pull the highest on this one, what will the tree look like after that? The first thing to do is to remove the currently highest one, take the lowest one here and move it up here. So after step one and two we have three, nine, eight, one and two and five and this one is removed. Seven, six, four. Do you agree with that? I had removed uh, the top root element and moved the, not the lowest one, the latest, the last one in the tree, the tree up here. Then I should start percolate it down. That means Compare it with its children and replace it with the one that is the largest one. And it should be larger than 3 itself. So I'm replacing it like this. 3, 9. I compare it with the children. I replace it with 8 and 3. I compare it with the children and I replace... No. This one is larger so I shouldn't replace it with any one. Do you understand the idea? What is the time complexity of inserting and pull the highest? What was the what was the time complexity in a, to search in a binary search tree? What? Log n. Log n. And this is basically we, a maximum is that for a binary, it is the height that determines it. And the, the height compared to the size is logarithmic. Did you understand that? So roughly the height of a tree is proportional to the second logarithm of the depth of the tree. So uh, we only need to take this many steps to go through to find the lowest level of a tree with this height. It should be the other way around. No, height and size, it should be, sorry. Of the tree. Uh, so both operations run in logarithmic time. We can uh, add a new element in logarithmic time and we can uh, remove an element in logarithmic time. Uh, you remember my simple approach here was linear and constant in the other one. So it's considered to be better to have logarithms in both operations. Did you understand the idea? How would you implement it? This is the clever part. I wish I was the one who come, come up with this idea. But it wasn't. Yeah. You can store your binary uh, heap in an array. Yeah. This is the tree. We are thinking of it as a tree, but we are storing it as an array and we are skipping index zero. And we add them layer, one layer at a time. 11, 10, 7, 9, 5, 6, 4, 8, 2, 3, 1. We are adding them one layer at a time. Then we can go to the parent. For an element in array position n, it holds that the parent is always in n divided by 2, integer division. The left child is always in position 2 times n, and the right child is always in position 2 times n plus 1. So rather than moving uh, from the one node to the other, we can just do these simple operations to jump from child to parent and things like this. 
So for example here, uh, let's look at number 5 uh, in position 5. It corresponds to this node. If I divide 5 by 2, I will end up using integer division in position 2, and it's this one. If I uh, would like to move to the left side, the rule says I should multiply the index with a 2, that means 10, and it turns out that the left side is always here. I think it's a clever idea. So rather than implementing a root node, an object which is a, a node having two children and move along in this tree, we can move along. Uh, when we want to go to the parent, we just divide the position by 2, left side, multiply by 2, and so forth. It can be done very quickly and very shortly. Do you understand the basic idea? I will not show you an example of how to implement insert and pull highest using this approach. It will be your task in, the, in one of the assignments. So, in summary, a binary heap is an implement. We, we have a data structure. The data structure is priority queue. A binary heap is an implementation technique for how to implement a priority queue. Uh, just like a linked list is a technique to implement lists, the idea of a tree or an array is an implementation technique for how to implement this general data structure called the priority queue. We think of the binary heap as a binary tree, but we implement it using arrays. So this one will not be ever be used in your implementation. This is just the picture we have in our mind for how to understand how it moves things, but we are implementing it just using one array. Uh, so this one you are having in your mind, you're doing sketches, you make sure that everything works as it should, having this one in your mind, but you're implementing it using the array approach that I just showed you. Okay. I thought you should give me an applaud here for this fantastic data structure, but I guess you're a bit tired. So, assignment four uh, is to implement a class binary int heap. This is the simplest version. The element we are storing is the same as the priority. We are saying that you should have a constructor that looks like this. We should have an insert method, pull highest, current size and is empty. We are specifying that this is what we expect from it. And we are expecting you to use an array-based implementation. You should not copy your binary tree from exercise assignment 3 and start to using it. It could be done in that way, but we want you to use arrays. Also, write a JUnit test case to check the correctness of your heap implementation. Yeah. Any questions related to this one. The final exercise in this course, I would say, <coughs> uh, is a VG exercise, then we want you to do it more properly. A general data structure for priority queue. We want to have an abstract class or interface. You decide that is named priority queue and it should also uh, have a task. This is an interface or an abstract class. You decide. The implementation. So you are designing what should the general interface for a priority queue and what should the general interface for a task look like in the priority queue. Then provide a concrete implementation that is called work task and binary heap queue here. So first, you are designing the properties of the data structure basically by specifying what do you mean by a priority queue. What can be added to a priority queue? It is the tasks. Then you provide one implementation of them based uh, on the array, the the, based on the binary heap approach that I just presented for you. So design a general data structure uh, for a priority queue. I think this is it. Any questions? Uh, <coughs> we have one more lecture. It is in next week, I guess, uh, and I will present an old written exam and 
discuss how to solve that one. I will also publish this uh, old written exam hopefully today or tomorrow. Any questions related to the upcoming exam? Have you um, registered yourself for the written exam? You know that it will close down about uh, 10 days before the exam. Don't mail me if you have forgotten it, Henry. <laughs> 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 yeah. I, in particular, he has missed all the deadlines so far in Java 1 and Java 2, I would guess. I thought it was on Tuesday. <laughs> uh, uh, any other questions? Okay, see you next week. Bye. <laughs>